output modeling and subnational um, economic indicators. I really set up this session for selfish reasons. Um, I wanted to hear more from uh, James and those at the Fraser of Alander Institute, um, as well as um, Kirsten and her group at the, the Turin Institute. Um, but also this, this session has stemmed out of really some of the successes of ESCO in enabling us really um, as a national statistics organization, um, ONS, so, so I'm from ONS, um, to be at the cutting edge of um, developments in regional economics um, and the participation and collaboration with um, the Fraser of Alander Institute as part of the previous ESCO uh, project and with uh, the Alan Turin Institute as part of future um, economic developments um, that are ongoing um, has really helped us immeasurably in the, in the, in the production of interregional trade data, which is the project that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and without further ado, I will move on to my own slides. If I can work the mouse. Right, so the, the as, as I've said, the, the project. Um, so this, this paper is really um, a paper that discusses uh, the interregional trade project, which is, is, is really the, the outcome of uh, a huge partnership and collaboration between a whole host of um, institutions, um, not least the Department for Business and Trade and Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, who provided financial support, but also um, significant advice across the way, as well as um, special attention needs to be given to the devolved administration, so NISRA, the Welsh Government and the Scottish Government, um, without which the, the work that I've been able to produce would not be possible. Um, they have been more than generous with their time, um, with their data and with their collaboration, so I wanted to, to give um, special attention there. Um, so this project, the Interregional Trade Project, um, is part of the Subnational Statistics Data Strategy, which was published in 2021, um, which has stemmed out itself from the levelling up um, policy agenda, which has pr made priority um, a whole host of work across um, subnational data indicators, um, and the, there's been huge successes on that so far. Um, so this is just an outline of, of my presentation. Essentially, I'm going to go over what interregional trade is. It seems reasonably straightforward, but there are some complexities to it. Um, an understanding of the international best practice that was defined really by the, the previous ESCO work, and the recommendations that were provided by the, the ESCO work for the approach for producing interregional trade data in the UK. The challenges to implementing that from a national statistics organization as well. And then I'm going to go on to the, the current UK approach um, that we have in development, which is this hybrid bottom-up approach. Um, there are some remaining contextual challenges that I'm going to go over, and then I'm going to finish on by talking about what interregional trade data enable and why this is uh, so important for us to gather. So what is interregional trade? On this project, it's trading goods and or services between UK regions at the ITL1 level or international territorial one level. So this is the three devolved administrations and the nine English regions, as you can see on the map. There are some distinct challenges and opportunities to um, interregional trade that may differ, that, uh, many of which were defined by Erlin in the early 1920s. Um, so for example, interregional trade is not affected by currency or exchange rate um, effects, nor is it generally um, affected by national regulatory differences, although we will be aware of some of these that exist. Um, that are currently being investigated by the Office for Internal Market. Um, and it is affected by um, the mobility of goods, which will be explored with some specific indicators that we'll talk about later. Um, I just want to labour what it is a little bit more. Um, we try as far as possible to stick with the international trade standards. Um, so example one is the kind of obvious car parts manufacturer A um, in Wales, TLL, which is the ITL1 area moves goods to car manufacturer B in the West Midlands, TLG, um, and this is interregional trade, trade between trading goods between regions um, and between businesses. But it's also the movements of goods between ITL1, ITL regions, and between sites within the same business. Um, and this is captured through things like the Trade Survey for Wales, where they ask businesses to include any outputs that were internally transferred to parts of the businesses located outside of Wales. 
um, in the sales values. And there are some inconsistencies between this and the other trade surveys that we are drawing on, but principally this is, is the kind of thing that we're looking at. Um, there is another example. I didn't include it in the slide because I had to get confirmation by the data owner, um, which happened after I'd written the slides. Um, and this is things like payment for intangible services, um, for example, royalty payments for intellectual property. And this is tracked by us in the business to business transactions data on a head office to head office basis unless the other survey data says otherwise. This is potentially problematic for a lot of businesses, um, but conceptually we, we have to come to terms with um, where it's appropriate to consider um, head offices as the locus of um, economic exchange and where local units are, are the more relevant um, site. So this is the international best practice that was um, uh, defined in a paper by Mary Sparridge and Nia Davison. Um, that we really use as the framework for developing interregional trade here in ONS. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. Um, the two things I did want to highlight were the purposes for collecting interregional trade data across all of these nations tends to be input output tables or supply use tables for us because of the nature of the data being um, constructed on a industry basis for consistency across data sets we're really only looking at input output modeling at this point in time um, the other point i wanted to highlight were the two approaches which is survey or non-survey or hybrid approach and we are very much taking the the hybrid so survey plus admin data approach here there were a number of recommendations um, from the ESCO report, um, and these are defined here to enable us to be able to produce um, interregional trade estimates at the ITL1 level. The first one is coherence should be achieved in trade surveys that collect interregional uh, trade data on a consistent approach um, to frequency and complexity of surveys, a consistent approach to questions on interregional trade, a consistent approach to business and industry classification, and a consistent approach to sampling. Um, and we ha are working to overcome all of these issues in our collaboration with the devolved administrations and our use of the microdata that's provided by them. The other recommendation is that um, existing data gaps should be filled um, and these could be filled with by leveraging other data sources. For example, there's no survey currently that covers England. So to produce interregional trade data, we would have to use England as a residual, um, which does have a detrimental effect on the quality of the estimates. But in terms of leveraging other data sources to enable us to improve the quality of these estimates, we are using things like transportation data as specifically um, suggested by the ESCO report. Um, to regionalise uh, trade flow in England from the, the country level down to the ITR1 regions, as well as business-to-business -business transactions data to regionalise the, the, the equivalent for services. And following these recommendations, we should be able to produce data at an ITR1 level, and this is what we will be achieving by August uh, autumn 2024. So what are the challenges to this bottom-up approach? Um, and this is region, really a regional accounts challenge. Many UK regional accounts outputs are produced on a top-down basis. So these are national estimates that are apportion, apportioned using regional variable. So subnational trade, for example, is apportioned by local unit employment. Interregional trade estimates will be produced from a bottom-up perspective, only minimally drawing on apportionment where we're using um, other data sources, so ONS business surveys, to, to link with our primary data sources, which are the devolved administration trade surveys. The potential benefit of this is that we're better able to represent regional economies. The limitations are that constraining to national estimates will be very, very difficult. Um, compatibility with existing regional accounts estimates will be um, also difficult in the compilation of things like regional GDP and regional GVA. But we are working with um, colleagues from the Department for Business and Trade and the OECD as part of a regional trade and value added project to enable us to use our interregional trade estimates as an input within that process. Um, the, the final challenge is the quality of interregional trade estimates can't really be benchmarked against national accounts, but we work to, to get around that, we do quality check our output through triangulating observations across numerous data sets. So the first stage in producing uh, interregional trade data is creating coherent trade survey data. So we take the devolved administration trade survey data, so the trade survey for Wales, the Northern Ireland Annual Business Inquiry, and the Global Connection Survey, 
and we look at how we can improve the, the coherence in terms of survey design. So we work closely with the devolved administrations to adapt to existing survey design. And we had a meeting, for example, with the Welsh Government last week on how they can make their survey more coherent in relation to the other surveys. And we're having uh, similar conversations with the other devolved administrations. And then what we're doing with the data that we receive in the raw format is we're adjusting weighting methodologies. So for example, their approach to outliering um, to ensure that it's coherent whilst maintaining the, the quality and structure of the, the survey samples, as well as things like aligning definitional differences at the industry level and the, the differences in terms of how each of the surveys identifies businesses within their locations. The next step is to improve the quality and coverage of the devolved administration survey through linkage to ONS business surveys um, by what we call the reporting unit reference, which is consistent across all of these survey data sets. Um, and we're using these data sets to do things like uh, fill specific gaps, so fill the gap of Scottish inputs that's not collected as part of the Global Connection Survey, um, improve coverage um, where there are particularly small samples, for example, Scotland and Welsh surveys are not mandatory, so the sample size tends to be reasonably low, um, as well as um, assessing the quality of the outputs through triangulation of data points across multiple um, sources. Um, and from this work, we are able to produce this three regional, uh, three region trade matrix with England as a residual, uh, and we're essentially at this point in the development, at this point in time. But we want to do better. We want to have better quality and a better granularity um, of output. And to be able to achieve this, we are drawing on novel um, admin data sets. The first one I'm going to talk about, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, is the business to business transactions data. I'm not going to go into detail in terms of what it is, um, because this will be covered by um, Kirsten a little bit later on. Um, but I will cover what we're going to use it for. Um, and we're using this, these data to construct uh, bilateral transaction flows at the SIC um, and ITR1 level from anonymized aggregated data to disaggregate England into the nine ITR1 areas and to weight country level trade flows. Um, and this is clearly a, a key data set for trading services, which is a, a, a gap in knowledge. The main challenge with this data set is the head office effect. Um, so the origin and destination of transactions is observed at the head office level within a lot of this data. Um, conceptually, um, it, it's difficult to, to, to know how to correct for this and it, within which industries to um, correct for this because of the validity of um, economic exchange at the head office for certain industries. The other data set I wanted to talk about was the uh, continuing survey for road goods transport produced by the Department for Transport. This is an amazing data set that's really underutilised across government um, and it essentially um, covers haulage vehicles um, for two-week periods um, and covers all journeys within that two-week period and over a two-year period it covers all registered uh, UK haulage vehicles. Um, so this is not a census but it does have very good coverage. Um, so the work we've done on this so far has been to convert the transport classification NST to SIC um, to be comparable with the other data sets that we've been able to use. Um, and we're working on um, currently converting volume to value with HMRC data and HMRC interdepartmental business register linked data. And this is used very much in the same way as the business, business um, transactions data to disaggregate the uh, trading goods down to um, ITL1 within the English regions and to weight the, uh, the, the country level data that we have from the devolved administration trade surveys. Plus, this data is really, really interesting in terms of its ability to identify and control for internal transshipment or warehousing zones um, by um, observing higher density of freight intensity um, within specific areas and then weighting accordingly. Um, we're also a, a able to unpick a little bit the first and final destination effect as we have um, obviously first destination as well as onward legs of um, journeys and from that we expect to see the, the diagram that you can see there, we expect to see a broader distribution of the, the heat map um, beyond the, the local areas um, which will kind of broaden out the gravity like um, visualisation that you can see there. 
There are still some conceptual challenges that I would like help with, please, anyone. Um, so the first one is what constitutes chain trade. Um, there is conceptual variation in data sets. For example, the business to business transactions data um, captures economic exchange, whereas the, the road haulage data captures the physical movement of goods. These are incompatible from a trade perspective. The way that we're currently getting around this is by um, using these data sets as weighting parameters to apply to survey data sets. Um, this is not an ideal or perfect resolution, but it's what we've got at the moment. Um, and in the future, if we were to use these data sets as primary observations, they would need further work to, to reconcile some of these issues. Accounting for complex UK business structure, um, we do our best to enable us to be able to do this, but there are inconsistencies across the way the, um, the surveys collect these data. So uh, further exploring this will be uh, an important outcome, um, as well as assessing quality of data sets without constraining to, to national values. We've done all that we can to triangulate our observations across data sets, but there still remains the issue of what we do around this constraining point as we are committed to not constraining. And finally, I think this is the most important bit. Um, it's what these data enable, what are the future potential um, of these data? Um, these data are a key data input for cohesive UK regional input output tables. Scotland and Northern Ireland currently produce input output tables and Wales is working on them. Um, our concern is that these are not produced on a consistent basis um, and we're currently working with the Department for Business and Trade and OECD to use interregional trade estimates as an input into input output modelling as part of the regional trade and value added project which really puts front and centre the bottom up approach to compiling into regional trade data. Um, it will also enable us to produce regional GVA measures um, as well as for the first time being able to produce direct expenditure based GDP measures. Um, and that is the end of my slides. Thank you everybody. We do have 10 minutes for questions. Are there any questions in the room? Oh dear. I don't, I don't want to. Um, Myri. Um, <laughs> Let me get a pen. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mary Spouch from the Fraser Island Institute. Sorry, Chris, I just had some questions. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't resist. Um, you do have a real challenge here um, with the um, constraining point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you're you're right. Um, but it's how you can then use these to build um, a supply use and therefore drive input output tables for all regions of the UK, given that the regional accounts approach is to classify all uh, activity into the reporting unit industry instead of the local unit industry. Now, neither of these things are wrong. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, and they can be suitable for different uses. Um, and the sort of national consistency, so everything adds up to the national total, is understandably what ONS may want for a set of uh, regional tables, but that will not correspond with, with the sort of trade estimates here. So I, I think it is a real challenge, and I think it's difficult to see how it's going to work if regional accounts are still produced on the basis of the um, the reporting unit industry rather than the local unit. So as I say, they're both valid things to produce, um, but it is, it is a difficult challenge. Um, and I, I don't know how we get around it unless the data is collected on a different basis at the UK. Um, I'm interested in whether you're looking at, um, either as part of this project or more widely, the production of international exports from each region on a consistent basis. Because to put in context the exports that the each region is, is exporting to each other, I think that's quite important from a policy perspective, because those are not produced at the moment, you know, goods and services exports from each of the ITL ones internationally, you know, to put alongside uh, these uh, inter-regional estimates. Um, and I'm interested in how you're treating extra regio as well, um, or maybe we can, we can chat about that. Um, I'll stop there. Shall we do a couple of questions at the same time? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Oscar Lemmers, Statistics Netherlands. Uh, we are interested in this type of information as well, the regional input-output table. So I have one question and one suggestion to the question you had yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question is about the data and services. 
Uh, when I look at your data, you have like three main sources for that. You have who is producing what, who is using what, and to link those, those two things, uh, I think you are using uh, the business to business data. And my question is, do you have other information available to link the suppliers and the users? Because we do not have that nice data in the Netherlands. Um, and my remark was to what you mentioned before, huh, what is trade? You are combining all these data sets and they are different, how to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, my colleagues at the, the transport department, they had several integration projects uh, where they have like trade, the transport data, but even the national accounts things also at regional level. I do not know the details, but they might have something that could be useful for you and I will give you some details uh, later on. Yeah, Thank that'd you. be great. Thanks. Uh, hi, Russell Black, Office for National Statistics. Just can I clarify, so the definition of services is including goods transferred from one region to another. Does this also apply to services? So if I'm in the ONS office in London and the ONS IT team, which is based in the ONS office in Wales, uh, provides these services, are they exporting from Wales IT services to London? Conceptually, that's one of the challenges in how we, how we unpick that. Um, and it varies across the type of services that we are looking at, as well as the mode of supply by which they're provided. Obviously, um, we don't have a concrete answer to that. The way that the trade surveys capture it is in this, they, treat it, they try and treat it in, in a comparable way to the goods. Um, so we have that to base it off, but we also have the business to business transactions data, um, which, uh, as I've said, has the, the, the quite large head office effect issue. Sorry, I'm dealing with these questions in reverse order, saving the best to last, of course. Um, the, the, the data for services, who is producing what and who is using what? Um, do we have any other data? Um, in, from a, a supply use perspective, not really. We, we have the business to business transactions data and we have the, um, the survey data. Um, it would be good to have some further data to be able to triangulate across observations um, with that. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the data landscape for regional indicators is better than it used to be. Let's put it that way. Um, OK, uh, constraining um, and how we're going to overcome the challenge of producing data at the local unit level, or at least in a consistent way with the trade surveys, particularly the Scottish um, survey. Um, whilst constraining um, to data that's produced at the reporting unit level. Um, this is a challenge. I guess my priority has been to work on the assumption of producing the data that best represents the local regions that we're trying to represent um, and work on how we might uh, reach some kind of confluence um, when we're trying to look at the, the production of input-output tables. And we are doing significant work with um, the OECD to be able to get to that um, confluence. We're not there yet, um, but we are, we are um, making significant progress. Um, and international exports from each area, we do produce subnational trade um, by ITL areas um, that would be comparable with this. They are produced from a bottom-up perspective. As, you're, as you may be aware, so these are apportioned using employment as a proxy. Um, the data that we do have would enable us to produce them from a bottom-up perspective instead of the top-down. Um, but that would be part of a future development as opposed to anything that we currently have planned. Um, so it, it's that compromise between um, producing what we can um, as the best quality as we can. So it's, it's that, that, that point that was made previously, the, the um, the great is the enemy of the good, I think, um, and, and that's the position we're in at the moment. We do also have one qu uh, one online question um, by Daniele Cataccio, um, and he is asking: Will it be possible to use this new data to estimate the value and volume of interregional trade by rail, if not uh, if not existing already? The 
there is a separate data set that is produced, um, I believe, by National Rail on this specifically. We haven't put it as part of this particular development cycle because of essentially resource constraints and, and the need to be able to produce something within a given time frame. But it will be penciled in for future developments. Okay, um, if there's nothing further, I'll thank everybody um, and ask uh, James to come up to give his presentation. Okay. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so today I'm going to speak to you about the economic and socioeconomic impact of trade on a UK labour market. Uh, I'd hoped to be able to speak a little bit more about a project that we're currently working on. We're currently uh, stuck in data access limbo, which I'm sure many in the audience can empathise with. Uh, but we've just had confirmation this week that we'll be getting the data soon. But um, instead, I'm going to speak to you today about another project that uh, fed into the, um, what we're aiming to do in this new project uh, and lead you through um, our kind of pathway. So first thing I'm going to be speaking about, why does understanding the impact of trade matter? And what does the public expect from government trade policy? I'm going to speak about some exploratory work, particularly looking into some of the data issues and the limitations. Uh, but also looking at some kind of uh, results we've had about trying, trying to link this idea of trade to, um, uh, to jobs and to, to different sorts of job characteristics. Uh, I'm going to follow on with the, the new project and what we plan to do with this, particularly some, some really exciting new data sets that the UNS and others have released over the next, last few years, which have really opened the doors to what we're able to do. Uh, and finally end with uh, a couple of really exciting data sets, um, one of which is international trade data, the other one is transaction data, and how these sorts of data sets can completely unlock what we're able to do in the future um, in these sorts of projects. So firstly, why does trade matter? I'd say to, <coughs> to quite a lot of folk, perhaps less so the economists and statisticians in this room, to quite a lot of folk, trade is quite an abstract con uh, concept. Um, when you ask people generally about things like globalization or importing or so on, um, there's a good amount of polling evidence that, that generally people think it's a force for good and balance. However, you start asking, has globalization mostly benefited the wealthy rather than ordinary citizens? And there's also an ag agreement that yes, it has. These polling numbers flip around quite a lot depending on the question you ask. And I think that gets at this issue that, that that globalization and trade and words like these are, are really abstract concepts. You ask about imports and whether there should be more import tariffs, suddenly a lot of the public thinks, yes, there should be more import tariffs. So it can flip around quite a lot. But there's been a lot of discussion over, over the last several years about whether areas being left behind, to what degree that's occurring in, in international trade as well, to what degree there are winners and losers, whether that's on a place basis or whether that's on uh, different characteristics and so on. And so we hope to try and better understand winners and losers uh, a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so part of the new project is the new ESRC funded Centre for Inclusive Trade Policy. Uh, and a separate part of the CITP have commissioned the National Centre for Social Research to conduct um, a, a series of citizens juries based around different parts of the UK. Uh, and looking at public attitudes towards UK trade policy. So when asked, what do they see as the priority, the most important objective for UK trade policy? Just over half say economic growth. And that's, that's great, they, they, they seem pretty clear in that. But as soon as trade-offs were introduced, suddenly it became protect protecting industries, suddenly it became regional fairness, suddenly it became human rights and climate change and all these other issues. Whenever there's a trade-off introduced of would you rather more jobs overall or uh, more trade overall, or would you rather better protection of the climate, quite a lot of people would switch. So there's clearly 
some sort of uh, aspect here about what the public expects from a trade policy. Um, <clears throat> many people don't often understand how trade affects them in, in a macro sense. Uh, some, some, some of the issues, such as chlorinated chicken, are quite um, come to the fore, but often the, the indirect impacts of trade are not well understood. Um, so yeah, we started a project in 2018 with the uh, Department for International Trade, and now Business and Trade, to start exploring what data be required start to identify winners and losers, and to try and build a framework to try and um, try and identify some of these. So, one of the key aims was to identify these gaps, of which there are a few, um, <clears throat> and there are also a number of conditions to the project. Conditions that are actually really quite helpful in making sure it is limited in scope. And part of that was no microdata, it was UK government data only. We've had some discussions today about the asymmetries of trade data and the challenges that provides. Well, one of the challenges that provides is the belief of different governments in different sets of trade data and different data sources. Um, <clears throat> there was a look at gross impacts rather than global value chains. Global value chains were being explored in a separate project. Uh, and really looking for transparency and granularity over complexity. So this is a very useful set because uh, it led on to uh, a clear methodology, which was input-output modeling. Um, th there, were, there are a number of assumptions I'll, I'll warn up front in, in this project, and that those are uh, classic input-output assumptions around the use of averages. Uh, and I'll also speak a little bit later about how our new project is aiming to remove some of those assumptions uh, and dive more into the microdata end. So what are input-output tables? Well, input-output tables help us understand how industries export, how they interact with each other, and how they interact with labor, as well as a number of other things. In terms of input-output modeling, we often try to understand the direct, it's the direct impact of exporting for exporting industries themselves, and then the indirect, so the impact of exporting on industries and on their, sub well, on their supply chain. Um, <clears throat> So part, part of our methodology is about export data is being collected by industry and, and data and the characteristics of employment is collected by industry. So there's clearly a relationship that we can use there. The <coughs> industry average method isn't ideal, uh, but I'll show you what results we got from that and how we're aiming to improve that. So one of the first key issues that came up with, uh, that we came across was that there was no industry by industry input output table uh, back, back at that period. So many thanks to ONS for producing this. Fantastically helpful. Uh, we also brought in data from the ONS trading goods and trading services data sets, uh, and a number of other data sets, such as the annual population survey, to look at job characteristic data. As a bit of a primer to input output modeling, um, just to give a, a, a general sense of how it works. So you firstly have um, a final demand shock, such as, for instance, your services exports, which then leads to the, uh, that industry that's exporting more, producing output. So that's the bit in green, that's the direct impact. Then, you, then it leads on to purchases of the supply chain of the first layer, uh, and then it leads on to the supply chain, supply chain, and so on. And this is actually based on real numbers from an aggregated two industry, Northern Ireland in the output table. Um, <clears throat> so in general, how, the, how to conceptualize the direct and the indirect is the direct is the immediate response to an uplift in exports, and the indirect is capturing these uh, supply chain impacts um, and the supplier suppliers and so on. Uh, there are also leakages of which you could choose to uh, grow or shrink the scope to include or not include, uh, but um, those are often called different types, but uh, I won't cover those today. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna cover this briefly. If if you're interested in I.O., the, the, the way we achieved this was looking at both through a Leontief methodology, but also using a, a multiplier methodology. Um, and you might ask why we use both of them. Um, and part of this is because we tried to understand not just where do the jobs lie in terms of industries, but also understand which industries support more jobs through their, from their exports. We then mapped the impact on uh, on output into jobs and map the impact on jobs into different characteristics of jobs. 
So here's the headline numbers. Uh, the total of all UK exports is supported about 6.5 million full-time equivalent jobs, or 23% of UK full-time equivalent jobs in 2016. 3.8 million of these jobs were in the exporting industries, so that's the direct exports, and 2.7 million were in the supply chain. Next, we looked at, start looking at industry breakdowns, and we looked at this across 64 industries, uh, but I've picked out six examples here. Um, and this is where the difference between looking at a more Leontief uh, methodology and a more multiplier methodology comes in. Uh, so firstly, you can look at, uh, for manufacturing's exports, how many jobs in the UK are supported by manufacturing's exports. And that's 1.5 million jobs are supported by the exports manufacturing. But of all exports uh, in the UK, um, the jobs they support actually only support less than a million jobs in manufacturing. So in other words, manufacturing is a, a contributor in terms of the jobs it supports through its exports, more so than it is a beneficiary. And it's the reverse for admin support services. So, so these are sort of things you'd expect to see that uh, manufacturing has a lot of exports, and those exports support, support a lot of jobs within supply chains across the UK. And then we started moving on to characteristics. So what does it mean for jobs by gender. Uh, so we estimate that 64% of jobs directly and indirectly supported by exports were male. And that compares to only 54% of uh, jobs in the UK being male. So you might expect as well for exporting that a lot of exports come from manufacturing industries. A lot of manufacturing industries are quite uh, male dominated in terms of the labor force. Um, but then the indirect, so the supply chains, are slightly more balanced in terms of the, the uh, gender ratios. Looking at individual destinations, surprise, surprise, out of groups, the, e the EU is the, the largest, with 2.8 million jobs supported. And then the largest single country was the United States, 1.3 million jobs. So that was the, the fun numbers. And here's the, here's the limitations slide. Um, so the firms are aggregated in 64 sectors. Um, part of the power of input-output modeling is we can produce a lot of analysis by exploiting the industry averages in those tables. But exporting firms are not do not necessarily act like an average firm in that industry. This was a key concern we had with some of these results, um, which we've aimed to in a, in a new piece of work to look at further. Um, and you know, the evidence suggests that exporting firms do differ in terms of productivity and wages and supply chain integration and so on. So our, our jobs numbers probably do have an upwards bias. Um, so we wanted to move beyond some of these industry averages and, and dig into some of the microdata. So um, yeah, the next step forward. Uh, how, am I in, how am I in the time? So we're aiming to remove a lot of these industry assumptions, and part of this is through newly available data that's been released over the last couple of years. Um, firstly, we're looking to uh, tap into the new ONS trade and goods uh, data that's been linked to the IDBR. So thank you to ONS for releasing that, um, as well as the, uh, and, and, and ITIS as well, and link that to individual firms. So match that to individual firms. With that individual firm data, we're looking to match that to a new data set, which is the uh, ASH data, the annual survey of hours and earnings, linked to the England and Wales census. And through that, we can see one firm, who they employ and their characteristics, and whether they export or not, and what sorts of things they export. Being able to look at it on a firm basis will allow us to understand not just you know, do manufacturing uh, industries typically employ men or women differently, but actually, what do exporting firms and manufacturing industries do? And through this, we aim to extend the UK input output table. This is a two industry example, um, just to make sure it fits in the screen. Uh, but uh, we'd aim to take an industry, split it into exporters and non-exporters, where possible, split it into large exporters and small exporters. 
Now, granted, we'll have to be slightly careful about statistical disclosure, um, but the aim is to, to try and understand the purchases of exporters versus the purchases of non-exporters as well, try and better represent these supply chain uh, flows. Uh, and then part of what we plan to do with it as well is to explore uh, a more diverse range of characteristics uh, using the census data. So beyond sex, but also looking more at occupational classification. Uh, we did look at age before, but more age groups, uh, earnings as well, uh, and a variety of different characteristics. We plan to do more ge uh, geographical based um, results. Previously, we just used GVA regionalizations, which is obviously not ideal. Um, and also uh, multiple years of work. And then colleagues will also be uh, looking at how they can build this into their CGE model uh, and a gravity model as well. I'd just like to finish on um, saying as well why, why some of the other work that's been being discussed in this session is, is so important to work like this and a lot of other work out there. Um, a lot of the work that we've, we're hoping to achieve wouldn't have been available without the HMRC to IWR linked uh, data set, uh, nor would it be achieved without the census to ASH data set. Uh, the next steps are inter-regional trade data, which would help us dramatically improve understanding of the supply chains across the UK. So understanding how exports in Wales can support jobs in Scotland, for instance. And transaction data could, is potentially the, the next major leap forward, in my view, over the next decade for a lot of input output modeling in understanding actually which firm is buying from which firm um, so that we're not just identifying what the supply chains are of exporting industries or even just identifying what sorts of products exports buy, exporters buy, but we actually understand who are the exporters buying from, where are they based, who do they employ. So having a direct uh, sense of um, firm to firm tra transactions. So thank you, that's all from me today. I'm happy to take any questions. In the middle there, thank you. Hi, uh, hi Nick Alton, uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned two methods, the Leontief inverse, with which I am familiar, and the multiplier method. I've never heard of that before. Is it just a different way of looking at the Leontief uh, inverse, like say breaking it down into stages, or is it um, something fundamentally different based on different assumptions about economic behavior? Thank you, and I'll take another one as well. Art, thanks. My, my question is about your uh, your focus on export. So in the, in the U.S. literature, you have this uh, research tradition of uh, David Alter and many of his uh, colleagues who focus entirely on the import side uh, of trade, uh, evaluating whether uh, wh which types of workers are winners and which ones are, are losers. Uh, they completely disregard exports opportunities, for example, due to the integration of China into the world economy. Uh, but you take the uh, the, uh, the opposite extreme, only focusing on exports, and I think you can only sketch a good picture about how trade affects uh, employment in uh, in the UK if you also take the imports into account. So, and given the data that you have, I think you you can can do that. Uh, so I wonder whether why that's not on your list of things you would like to do uh, to do next. And one uh, question regarding the uh, the extensions you have in mind when focusing on differences between exporting firms and, and non-exporting firms. Of course, having information about their purchasing, uh, the, the, let's say the mix of, uh, of products they, they buy as, as intermediate inputs is important, but you also need information about who they sell in order to complete your, uh, your input output, uh, your extended in input output table. Do you have ideas about how to, how to achieve this? Thanks, yeah. Uh, so I'll start with the, the first question. So multiplier versus uh, Leontief. Uh, <coughs> multiplier is just an aggregation of the column, columns over Leontief. I suppose, in a sense, the methodologies are um, both very similar, but they're trying to achieve different ways of looking at the same data. 
So one of them is trying to understand um, where do the jobs lie resulting from one sector's exports. The other method aims to understand what are the total amount of jobs supported uh, by a sector's exports. So essentially there's, there's sector detail on the Leontief uh, methodology, whereas it's all just aggregated into one big lump in the multiplier methodology. Um, but yeah, absolutely, imports are important. Um, uh, and we do plan on looking at them. We don't, <coughs> part of what we're hoping to do is to, once we get our hands on the data, to actually see what we can do with it. Um, but yeah, I, it would be good to have a conversation maybe later about um, what your view on that is. But yeah, well, I know some of my colleagues are planning to do some work around there. So there, we are thinking about it and we are going beyond just thinking about exports for this. But um, uh, we had a nice handy project previously that we only looked at exports that I can speak about how we're going to progress in it today. The, the, the second part of, of who they sell to. So <coughs> yeah, currently the challenge with the purchases survey in terms of building up the IO is we can see um, what types of uh, products uh, firms are purchasing, but we don't necessarily know exactly who they're buying from. Um, now, partly there was going to be have there's going to have to be an, uh, a certain assumption put in place using data such as, for instance, Prodcom, so production-based data that's used to make an assumption around that, that link. But, th but that link is a weakness of, to be honest, quite a lot of IO analysis. You don't always have that knowledge of exactly, you know, if an exporting firm is buying pharmaceuticals, are they buying it from the, uh, from the wholesale sector or are they buying it from the pharmaceutical sector? We don't always have that knowledge and we don't even know exactly what that firm is going to be like. In fact, we very much don't know, are they buying it from a firm that's based in Scotland or from or, or Northern Ireland? Um, my hope is that the next presentation is going to give uh, an, a, a bit of a um, solution to that over the coming decade with transaction data. Um, but yeah, it's up until then, it's, it's mostly a best case of what can we do with the existing data. Uh, unless we have data like you know, even Belgian VAT data, which gives us some of these linkages, then it's difficult to see what we can do to do anything more. And that will be a big challenge in the regional uh, understanding that we, we have. Yeah, Oscar. Uh, thank you for this presentation, or for also for mentioning the upcoming work, so to speak. Um, I, you say, okay, it's a bit difficult to see who is selling to what, but I think you can already use uh, the exporter data. I mean, if you are exporting a lot, that means you cannot sell too much to the domestic market. If you are importing a lot, you will not use too much from the, the domestic market. And there is some work uh, that already looks at the robustness of all these types of uh, assumptions. Uh, and I will also shamelessly advertise the upcoming handbook of the OECD on this type of work. Uh, I think many of the questions you are looking at, uh, the confidentiality, how to deal with that, where to get the data, how to integrate all these uh, employment characteristics. Uh, the, the people in Finland have done wonderful work uh, on that. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share that. And at the end of the year, everything should be ready. And uh, it's like a blueprint to do all the work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Grice, it's obviously very nice uh, to have this uh, data set and being de developed and so on. What I was slightly wondering, this may just reflect my lack of knowledge in this area, what are the policy issues that you're trying to address? What are the policy questions that this would elucidate? I think you said at one point that the some of the policy key policy issues aren't currently answerable within the framework, but the improvements might move us in that direction. But what are these questions that we're trying to answer and what's the use of this data? Yeah, so <clears throat> part of what I've, I've seen from my own perspective over the last few years is that tr trade data is increasingly being seen as not just a means of um, delivering uh, economic growth. And part of the, partly that's a reflection in what we saw answered in, in the public polling. Um, so there's a, there's uh, uh, I suppose a, a keenness to try and understand how are different parts of the UK being impacted by trade policy, how are different groups in the UK being impacted, and I suppose it feeds into the, the levelling up agenda and so on. Um, so it's, I'm not going to claim that we're going to have any answers from this, but hopefully we'll have 
the first step in understanding who are some of the potential winners and losers from trade policy. Um, and then, you know, in theory, winners could be compensating losers. That's, that's part of what we're taught in Economics, economics 101, right? Um, whether that actually happens is difficult to say. Whether that happens without us knowing necessarily who the winners and losers are um, is also difficult to say. So the hope is to try and identify, have a better identification of, of whose groups are, and then <coughs> actually as well trying to launch a bit more into the causal understanding of some of these connections, because um, uh, it's one thing that the current work won't be able to answer. Uh, uh, you know, we try and answer the, the who, the where, and the why, but we don't exactly know how to make trade policy from this work. So actually having a bit better understanding of causal impacts of, um, of exporting on, on some of these groups in society would be vital next step as well. Uh, and Oscar as well, it'd be good to have a chat later about the handbook. Can I just maybe add to that? And it, and it kind of comes back to Bart's point about the obsession with exports instead of just uh, imports. Um, a lot of the, the policy customers for this original piece of work obviously was driven by DIT. Um, and to, you know, to be frank, their interest in how they could articulate what the benefits would be of um, you know, improving trade relationships with different countries um, you know, as, as new trade deals are signed. You know, that that was, was part of the interest that they had um, in this. And one of the ways to articulate that is obviously the, um, the numbers and types of jobs that could be generated from a, 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 an increase in exports in different sectors. Um, from the devolved administration's point of view, um, they, they all have strategies for increasing exporting um, in particular. Um, and this is because of the you know, perceived link between exporting firms and increases in productivity. Now, obviously, the, the literature is mixed on this in terms of the direction of this relationship and the, the causal nature of this. Um, but they do all have you know, targets to increase exporting. And, and um, so one of the other projects we're doing linked to this is to try and understand better the characteristics of trading firms in Northern Ireland, for example. So where are they and, and, and what sort of characteristics do they have and what sorts of people do they employ and therefore what might the benefits be? So there's a huge amount of interest in this in the, in the policy um, world. Um, but you know, we're ongoing and discussing with policymakers through this research and particularly the point that, that, that's been made about um, the way that the gains from trade can be different on the importing side um, is something that we'll keep researching as well. But that's kind of the policy genesis for a lot of this. Um, the the idea that if you export more, you're more productive, essentially. Um, just because it's mentioned the literature on imports and the uh, um, China shock and the massive amount of papers that's produced in the US, I always find it surprising there's been n not nearly as much research produced in that in the UK as the UK decline in the manufacturing share of employment, I think, fell faster than it did in the US um, for basically the same reasons um, why we haven't done more on the China shock in the UK. So it's very encouraging if this is exactly the stuff that you are wanting to do. It doesn't stop that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> absolutely. No, imports is high up on our list. We just haven't had a really had a chance to formalise um, exactly what we're going to be able to do with it yet. Um, but yeah, go going back to the policy question as well, it's it's been fascinating to see how much interest we've had from different different um, levels of government. I suppose so, from international governments to international organisations to national governments to um, uh, to devolve governments and even down to export agencies, you know, all very different sets of questions that we're asking from an export agency perspective. They're even just asking, you know, who are the exporters? How do we find them? So it even gets down to that perspective of um, not even identifying who are the winners and losers in society, but who are the actual exporters? <laughs> These are questions to some groups. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan Bonville Jim from Welsh Government. So I'm one of the people tasked with trying to produce input output tables in uh, Wales. But uh, just coming on the import side of things and kind of from the perspective of the policy uses for it, I guess, I think one of the main drivers of um, uh, Wales looking to produce input output tables, for example, is if um, demand is to increase in a particular industry or if we're to, as a government to invest in a particular industry, we want to know how much of the supply chain, I suppose, benefits or does the ripple effects in general 
um, are kind of staying in Wales and how much of that is going out to, you know, whether it be the rest of the UK or whether or not that be, um, you know, other, inter other international trading partners, um, how much is being kind of imported how, and, and in terms of where that goes up the supply chain. So that's kind of a big motivating factor to try and, you know, improve the quality of decision making around investments and to kind of, you know, better understand um, the Welsh economy as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, yeah. And that just highlights, again, the, the importance of inter-regional trade data um, and why we need to understand these flows backwards and forwards and as well the potentially importance of um, uh, how initiatives such as the OECDs uh, view towards regional supply and use tables will start to build a better picture along with this data of how these flows across the UK occur or within the regions of, of England as well. Uh, but I think I'm pretty much out of time now. One last question. Sorry, can't help myself. Yeah, yeah, just, just to add as well, though, when we're talking about regional supply use and, and the development of them by the OECD and, and, and by the Welsh Government, you know, inter-regional trade is not the only thing that matters or is hard to estimate. Um, there are lots of challenges here around household consumption and estimation of um, capital formation in different parts uh, of the UK, um, which are actually much hard, even harder maybe in some ways, certainly than, than regionalising output or activity, um, but maybe even than trade data. So uh, solving inter-regional trade won't be the be-all and end-all for producing good supply use tables at a regional level. Yeah, and nor will be the solution to IO modelling because you still have to make sure you can identify the shocks properly, which is a different ball game that is important. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll end it there. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Also, many thanks to Chris for organizing this session and for learning so much about other activities going on in relationship to interregional trade data. Um, the topic of my presentation was already covered in some of the earlier presentations with great hope about what payment data, whole payment data can help us in compiling large transaction in matrices across industries and also across regions. Um, but in my presentation, I will put a bit of salt into the soup because there are so many challenges that we first need to solve properly until we get there. But I personally believe that the data that we have is really promising, but yeah, there's still, there's still a long journey to go. Um, today I present the work um, of, um, of my co-authors and me, and one of them is also sitting in the audience, Johannes Lomar, and the others unfortunately not here. Francois will be there tomorrow. And um, well, what we're doing in our, in our work is that we try to reconstruct national accounts using large-scale financial transaction data. And what I will do in this presentation, first I will give a bit of a background of the back, back payment scheme that is from where we got the data. Um, I will give a few descriptives of the raw data, speak a little bit about the network structure of the data and how this data could be used. And then I will dive into the big challenge part of linking this data to economic, to official economic statistics that we have by now and um, explain some of the conceptual challenges. But yeah, let's begin with a bit of background about payment systems and data that we can get out of payment systems. What you can see here in the slide is the different types of how we do payments in the UK. So when we look, when we do within UK payments, we can use different payment schemes. And just to say a few words about what is a payment scheme, a payment scheme is something which the partners or the, normally these are banks, they have agreed on a certain set of rules 
rules of how they want to execute, um, execute financial transactions. And the data that we are using comes from the Bux payment scheme, which is mainly used by businesses, but only by UK businesses. And in order to be able to use this payment scheme, you have to, cert you have to satisfy certain eligibility criteria. But then many businesses use this data for many transactions because it's very secure. You can transfer large amounts of, of money through the payment scheme. So for example, if you want to do, if you want to buy a house, normally you would you cannot do it using another payment scheme rather than the CHAPS or the BUCKS payment scheme. The, amount of a ma the maximum amount of a transaction goes up to 20 million, whereas if you would use another scheme, you would rather use it for smaller amounts. Or you could also not use your Visa card to buy a house, and no business can do this. Um, card schemes are a little bit special, and also international trade, and I think this is why the, we might search for creative patches uh, if we want to cover international trade properly. Whenever you would do an international transaction, you would use the SWIFT payment scheme or another scheme in, in the European Union, the SEPA scheme, but they are all connected to the SWIFT in, infrastructure. And when we think about, about, okay, what is a payment system? It's composed of the scheme. I already mentioned the scheme. This is the set of rules that the banks have agreed up and um, it consists of an infrastructure, and the infrastructure is nothing other than a system of message exchange. So one bank is sending a message to another bank and says, please put some money out of this account and transfer it to another account. So it's a system of message exchange. And what we have in our data is this information, the message system. So we have the payment messages going on between, uh, being transferred between different accounts. And I already mentioned our, data's co our data covers the, the BUX payment scheme um, where um, different instruments are used, so direct credit and direct, um, uh, and direct debit transfers. It is used for regular transactions and for high volume payments. So for example, if a firm wants to pay its employees, it would normally also use the Bux payment scheme. Only in very few exceptions, they use other schemes. And um, what we have or what we are using in our work is um, so far just an experimental data set where um, our colleagues from the ONS have linked the service user number, um, which is in the scheme, to, um, to businesses and mapped these businesses to two and five digit SIC industries. And um, so using this data, we already have readily available an inter interregional input output table and this is what uh, what we have plotted here on the on the right hand side this is the inter interregional trade network of the UK um, one can see one effect that was already mentioned if you look if you look down to the region London you can see that there's a lot of trade going on so the the size of the arrow um, indicates the volume of transactions in this area um, and yeah this is um, yeah the famous headquarter effect that we very likely um, have to uh, to find a solution for um, but just to give you some numbers about the amount of transactions that we cover with our data so the annual value of transaction accounts for 1.2 trillion which is quite a lot so if we benchmark this for example f to the UK GDP the annual, annual GDP is about 50 percent of this uh, uh, you know two times more than this value um, and but we we only we do not have all transactions in this in our experimental data set so we only have about 24 percent of of all transactions made through the Bux payment scheme, at least in our experimental data set that we're using for our current work. Um, the volume of transaction is the amount of transactions. So in our data, we can not only identify the amount of money which is exchanged between businesses, but also how often they do transactions. Um, and, but we only have a very small number in our current data, but this is due to the fact that we only have B2B payments and the, the vast majority in terms of of, um, of transaction counts goes to employees or 
consumers paying their bills, which are normally very small payments. So we only have B2B. What we, at the moment, we do not have B2C or C2B. Um, and well, the, the average value of transaction also um, reflects this fact very well. So the average value of a transaction in our data set is, uh, accounts for about uh, 16K pound, um, which is much higher than the average in bucks. Mm. However, our data is already quite nice. So when we think, um, when we look at, at the properties of the network, we can, we can reproduce certain stylized facts that have been already documented in the network literature. For example, correlation of annual growth rates. We know from other research that had been done before that industries which are closely connected in the network, that their business dynamics correlate. So um, here on this figure, um, we are showing a correlation plot, um, which is the geodesic network distance um, shown on the horizontal axis and um, the correlation of the growth rates. And what we can see is that the correlation goes down the further or the larger the distance between two industries becomes. So just to give you an example, for example, the, me uh, the, the milk and the cheese industry would be connected by only one link. So uh, cheese buys milk from the milk industry. But then if there is a producer of um, of feed for the cattle of the milk, this would be one distance far, f farther away from, uh, from the cheese industry because it has to go through the, the milk industry. And what we can see is that these correlations decrease, which is nice in our data because we are able to reproduce stylized facts that have been documented earlier. Similarly, for uh, centrality in our network, we find, um, um, so, so this is a plot, um, a cumulative distribution plot of, of the centrality of the network, and which looks fairly similar to, to figures of other, um, of other network data. And um, yeah, we find a power law-like structure. And this is important because if we want to understand the microeconomic origins, the micro-level origins of aggregate fluctuations, other research has shown that very central industries in an, in an input-output network have a big impact on, on aggregate fluctuations. And other researchers have been able to trace back macroeconomic GDP volatility back to, to small productivity shocks in, in, in specific industries. And we know that this correlates um, with, uh, with the network structure. Well, now I'm coming to the big challenge of our work. So far, I've just shown you a few numbers of the raw data. Um, but what we have done or what we are doing in our work is that we try to reconstruct national accounts. And we do so by um, doing a systematic comparison of our payment network with the official um, ONS supply and use tables. And the data that we have available um, or where we have overlapping data, so our payment data, we have a time series of a network, monthly data from 2015 until 2000, mid-2022, but the ONS data ends in 2020. Therefore, we have these, uh, these six years where we can make a direct comparison. And we have matched, uh, we have harmonized the data, and we have about 80 industries that we can compare. We can compare the data at the node level, so at the industry level, but we can also look at the, the individual transaction links, which are, would be the edges in the network. And when we look, just to show you a few numbers, so that there are differences in the two types of networks, but we get a fairly good correlation without having undertaken any cleaning with our data. So at the transaction level, which is the link level correlation, the raw correlation accounts for about 20%, and it is higher if we, if we take the log of the data. At the industry level, so looking at the sum of inputs or sum of, uh, of outputs, we get an even higher correlation ranging between 40 and 60 percent, depend on whether we look at inputs or outputs. And we have also compiled um, regional data and have uh, calculated the correlation with gross value added, which is the only um, or the best um, industry 
region industry level data that we can get for 80 industries and there we find a fairly high correlation of about um, 35 percent but um, yeah so far we have not undertaken any cleaning and now I come to one of the big conceptual challenges that we face in our work um, so national accounts and payment data differ our payment data includes for uh, just to, to give you the an example or an overview of the key differences. So, for example, when we look at investment, um, the, inter the input output tables of the ONS are intermediate goods. And, but we have all types of transactions and we do not distinguish. There will be ways how to filter out investments by using a product. So we have five digit level data, not at the regional level, but at the national level um, due to disclosure reasons. So principally this data would be also available, but we don't have it or we cannot work with it. Um, but um, so there are ways how to patch it, but yeah, at the moment we do not, we still have investments in our data. Imports and exports, um, there might be very special cases where an importer or exporter is a special trader and could have an, a service user number and would therefore be in our data, but um, these would be very likely very rare cases and they would require special treatment. Um, but yeah, we don't have imports and exports in our data, but in the combined use tables of the ONS, um, the, the input uses includes, uh, includes imports, but exports are also not captured. Um, Goods bought for resale. This is the whole retail and wholesale sector. And I will show you later a figure where you can see why re the retail and wholesale sector could be a, is a big challenge in our data. Um, we have all the trade in our data, so goods, just bought, goods that are just bought for resale are in our data, whereas they are excluded in the ONS supply and use tables. Transport margins. We believe that they, are prob uh, that they are correctly included because our data is at purchases pr prices um, and they are, also, um, they are also correctly included in the ONS um, combined use tables. Um, another big challenge is public administration, which has a very special treatment in the, in the official statistics. Um, and we believe in our case that there's a lot of misclassification because the sector builds a big outlier and um, yeah we also have a few challenges with the financial sector because they often act as intermediaries and uh, as intermediaries of trade and we also have um, have loans and repayments in our in our transaction data good um, now I'm just showing two more figures. So when we make a direct comparison of, of, our, of our payment data with the ONS data um, of the supply and use table, and this is just a plot where um, the ONS data is shown on the horizontal axis, the payment data on the vertical axis, and um, if both tables would be identical, then the, all the nodes would be, all the dots would be, would be on the, on the um, on the line, but uh, on the diagonal, but they are not. Um, what we can see here is that um, many of the industries score lower, so we have lower values of transactions in our payment data. We do not have all transactions that they make, um, with um, a few exceptions where our payment data shows higher values of transactions of certain industries. Um, we also think that the manufacturing sector is a bit less represented in our data and there, there, can, be, there can be reasons due to the nature of payment systems, um, and, but services seem to be fairly well covered. Um, you can also see a few outlier cases where we have higher values in our payment data than, uh, than we have in the official statistics. Um, and this pattern is even more striking if we look at, at centrality, at the network structure of our data. Um, here, um, this is a plot of, um, 
of the katz bonacic um, centrality measure that I've shown earlier when, when I spoke about aggregate fluctuations. And we see a few industries which are, uh, which are highly central. So um, this is G46, O84, and K65, uh, 64. And um, below on the right-hand side, I've wrote down which industries these are. So it's the hotel and retail sector, which takes a very central position in, in the payment data, likely due to their role as a, as a financial intermediary. So a lot of trade is going through the retail and wholesale sector, but if there is a retailer being just an intermediary of trade between, let's say, the car, uh, car part manufacturer and the car manufacturer. We don't want to have the retail sector or the wholesale sector. We want to have the direct link between these two industries. And this is a big challenge that we still need to fix in our payment data. Um, I mentioned earlier that also financial services are, um, are different in our data, also due to the fact that we have um, the repayment of loans in, in, the in the payment data, but there are certain things which need to be, um, yeah, which need to be, um, need to be cleaned if, in case we want to have a perfectly, in case we want to have an input-output table um, as, as, it's, um, official, as we have it in the official statistics. And yeah, also the public sector um, is um, probably a bit misclassified in our, in our data. And um, this is important um, because so far all the studies on the transmission of shocks so and all the work also related to input-output multipliers had been done with traditional, with the more traditional approach to input-output tables. Um, but in our, in our data, the channels of tra uh, shock transmission would be different because there's a lot of stuff going through the retail and, hotel se and wholesale sector. I mean, it's just an empirical exercise to test whether um, whether we would still get the same results, um, but um, but this is an effect that we need to keep in mind when we do economic analysis with our data, or we have to clean our data before. Okay, um, no, I will um, I will just wrap up and just um, say um, a few words about why this is nice to have. Um, so we have used large scale and payment data to reconstruct national accounts and the key use cases that we see in our data is um, that principally we would be able to have national accounts in, re in real time. If we are able to solve all the challenges that I've, uh, that I've um, um, just explained before, principally we can extract the data in real, real time from, uh, from the infrastructure of the payment system. I mean, we are not yet there, and there are many issues related to statistical disclosure, etc. But principally, this would be possible, and also at a much higher level at, of, of granularity as as we have in, in our in our experimental data set. And also the case of interregional input-output tables. So we do already have an interregional structure in our data. Um, there are still a few things that we need to understand better, for example, the headquarter effect, but we already get out, without having undertaken any cleaning efforts, we already get a fairly high correlation in terms of, of in the industry level um, 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 gross value added, which is a good signal. And we can also apply just statistical methods, doing brute force and, and trying to get a better mapping. Um, and finally, um, so our goal, goal with undertaking this work is um, to use the granularity of the data to study supply chain disruptions and the and fluctuations, so the, per, the percolation of shocks from the micro level to the macro level and to, to understand better how supply chains uh, work. Okay. That's it from my side. I look forward to your questions and uh, thanks.
Um, thanks for that. Really interesting. Um, such exciting data. Um, it, it struck me when you were talking about some of the issues you're having and some of the sectors you're having issues with. Um, they're likely to be the sectors for which more work is done during the supply use process, in any case by ONS. So things like um, exhaustiveness adjustments, um, you know, the, the redistribution of, of margins to other products in the wholesale and retail sector. Um, you know, and, and the and the this, you know the differential treatment of non-market output and, and 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 these sorts of things. So, um, I guess in terms of the issues that you're having, the investment one's more tricky, maybe in terms of the. Um, but perhaps there is something you can do with with the products that are are um, generally bought. Um, but you know, the supply use doesn't pop into being out of the survey data that the one s are using you know there are a lot of things that are then done to that data to get it there so there might be that there's some sort of framework based on the process of the production of the supply use to adjust the data that you have to think well generally these are the exhaustiveness adjustments that are done to each of these sectors these are the way that margins are redistributed amongst products and wholesale and retail you know these sorts of things to be able to sort of adjust um, your view of the intermediate use table into more like what would you know that it would look like in the SUP. Um, uh, thank you for this lovely presentation. Uh, it is good to see that there is quite some work uh, on getting all this microdata to get more granularity, to get deeper insights in what is really happening in the economy. Um, my question is about the time involved. Yeah, it is, I know that, at least in the Netherlands, uh, and probably in other countries as well, people are trying quite hard to get this type of data. Yeah, it is a bit jealous on the Belgians, they have all this VAT data, jealous here on the people in the UK who have all this uh, trade tra transaction data. But suppose that after all these years, tomorrow the people of the banks say to us, okay, here you will have it. You get all this transaction data. Could you have like a very rough estimate, huh? like the work you and your colleagues have done so far, uh, the work that we would have to do as well, uh, how much order of magnitude is that? Is that like one person a year? Is it like five, 10, 50? And also the, the way ahead, hey, you mentioned in principle, it's possible to get the granularity, to improve the input output tables, to get into regional data, but the order of magnitude of person years to achieve that. Uh, I can imagine that you cannot say, well, I think it's 45.2. I do not expect that, but uh, like order of magnitude, do you think it's like one person year or 10 or 50? Uh, that would also help us how hard do we have to push the banks to finally get that data. Thank you. Thank you. I also enjoyed the presentation very much. Um, I was wondering, uh, in the comparisons between your uh, outcomes of your your pay and the analysis of your payment data and the uh, the ONS supply and use tables, you, if I understood correctly, understand correctly, you uh, focused on uh, on sales. So let's say on gross output, uh, considering whether these match or not, and then for some industries they do, for others they don't. But I would be interested, I think, in uh, trying to figure out whether your analysis yields sensible outcomes regarding value added by industry. Because in the end, I think that matters. Uh, also, if we would like to focus on, on regions, you would like to know how much value added is generated by the chemicals industry in region A or in region B. And we are much less concerned about gross output, I think, because that's not a good indicator of economic activity and it cannot be related to employment, for example. So did you check uh, or do you have plans to check uh, the extent to which uh, value added by industry in the ONS tables matches the uh, implied value added indicators uh, in, uh, using your payments data? Okay, I will already begin answering the question. So I will start with the last question. So I calculated the correlations with gross value added at the regional level as w at the industry level as well. 
and the correlations are, they are not too different from the sum of outputs from gross output and gross input correlations um, as I've I don't know the number by heart, but it also accounted for. So we took gross value added from the supply and use tables and just looked at the, um, I think it's on the bottom rows, and we just calculated the correlations and they are similarly high. But, uh, yeah, but, but did you consider the correlation between your uh, payment value and gross value added, or between value added implied by the sales of a firm in your network Um, so you mean the indirect effect as well? No, not indirect. Just uh, so if, if a firm can sell a lot, but if mm -hmm. it uh, also purchases a lot, then its value added is very low, can be very low. Whereas if it uh, produces roughly from scratch, then uh, the uh, link between gross output or sales and the value added is almost 100%. So I was wondering which correlation you actually computed, and I would be interested in the value added that you uh, could derive from your from your payment. Okay. Yeah. So at the moment we cannot yet derive value added from the payment data, but we are very close to get another data set, which is the um, which is like the salaries paid to the employees, which could help us getting. Uh, getting more information about value added or to to calculate value added like proxies or employment proxies for out of the payment data if this is yeah yeah um, so uh, we we have so far just calculated the correlation of gross value added that we can get out of the supply and use tables and there are the correlations with the with gross outputs in the payment data and the ons gross value added are fairly high but this is just the row sum or the row in the in the supply and use tables um, but they are primary inputs um, but in my understanding this would be linked to employment but yeah happy to chat later um, okay, then, um, how many person years? Who? Tricky question. Especially as um, payment systems are very heterogeneous across countries. And I personally believe um, in the European Union, it's even a bit more complicated because we had decades of a financial conversion, bringing payment systems from different countries, harmonizing them over the years, and there are still very high regional differences in how banks execute payments, which payment, so for example, the German, I'm German, and in Germany you can still pay almost everywhere in cash. Um, and many people love to pay in cash. Um, I mean, the businesses likely don't do this, um, but there are a few things um, where, um, where we might have conceptual differences across countries. So I think in the European Union, we would encounter a few other challenges. Um, in terms of person years um, of this data, so. Um, so far, we were not too many people, but I think it was a very painful process to get the data, to get access to the data. One of my colleagues, um, Victor Mirinius, who's also one of the co-authors on, on this project, he invested his blood and laugh into the project of uh, convincing the data owners to, to make it available. And even, even now we have, um, we have a, just a very tiny data set of that what b would be possible. Um, my colleagues from the ONS maybe know a bit more about the number of people involved in the whole project so far. I think the project was kicked off about three years ago, roughly. And since then, I would say that many people just spent a bit of their time. There were not many people working on f in full time on the project. Um, but I would say we were a group of about 10, 15 people 
working in part time on the project. And, but we are just in the very beginning and there's still a lot, I believe there's a lot that can be automated. Um, so for example, in the message system, so the, the payment message system, so to say, um, has certain standards and um, so the ESO, uh, st it's a certain ESO standard which is used by the SWIFT scheme and which helps, which can help linking or identifying businesses and then the businesses need to be mapped to industries. Um, I mean, we could also have had firm level data, but yeah, it's too disclosive. Um, but I believe there are certain steps that could be automated and that would need to be done only one time. So it's finding a good approach to, classif to the classification, but I think this would not take too much time. And also, once we have understood the challenges of, for example, dealing, I, I can already come a little bit to the, to the other question, to the first question that what was asked about the challenges. Um, if we have solved one of the challenges of how to t deal with headquarter effects, how to deal with, um, with uh, the wholesale sector, for example, I believe many of these steps or many of the, the thoughts, at least of the conceptual work, could be transferred to other, to other data sets and um, could help. But um, who, number of person years. Um, so I would, um, oh, it's so hard, I mean, I'm not a person, um, please, do, um, I would, uh, I mean, so far, there were nobody, nobody was really working in full time on the project. So I would say, but it's good if you have a team working in full time of 10 to 20 people, this would be a very good starting point. And then you have people who can invest a lot of resources and then it would not take, hopefully not too long to, to have the data, but the challenges might differ across countries. Um, yeah, and in terms of what other stuff we can get from the ONS. So um, one of my colleagues, um, Katie, who had been working on the project earlier, um, she did a great effort of linking some of the server users, user numbers to, um, to firms in the, in the business register of the ONS, and therefore, I believe, I mean, I'm not an expert in what data sources are available at the ONS and how the data is used to construct the national accounts, but I believe principally if one would go firm level, bus uh, service user number level, and link the data that we have in our transaction data one-to-one -to, -one to the data that we can get out of the surveys, and this should be principally possible then I believe this could help us a lot understanding the relationship between the payment data and between, um, between the data that is collected through the surveys. Um, and um, I think there are also a few other, so we have not yet exploited other data sources from the ONS, but I believe this will, could be a very good starting point. And um, did I, you might have... It's just just to say that what I meant was once they collect survey data, there are a number of adjustments that are done through the supplies production process, which are probably causing, which may well cause the same issues, um, you know, so especially the redistribution of margins and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's worth talking to the supply use team about the things they do after they collect their data to, to, to produce the supply use table. Yeah, yeah, we're in, in touch uh, with uh, some of the people working at the ONS on the input-output tables, and yeah, we just hope to learn from them, and um, would be good to do a proper benchmarking, and yeah, still a lot of need of for knowledge exchange. Yes, um, well, thanks very much. Uh, you're comparing your financial data with the ONS's combined use table, and that's nowadays compiled using purchases survey um, with further processing as, as we've just been pointed out. But the purchases survey hasn't always been around. That was a gap, you know, I forget the exact time period, when there was no purchases survey at all, but there were still supply and use tables being published. So it'd be interesting to see how much difference that makes uh, by comparison with what the financial data would reveal because then you'd be comparing not actual data on purchases, but with some algorithm, I think probably RAS, which is used to update input-output tables on a purely mechanical basis. And so then you could look at your financial data and see whether the, the, the pattern of correlations, for example, 
uh, changed in this period when there was essentially no empirical data, only modeling. Um, yeah, that's true. This is also something that we found out and uh, through um, our interaction with the ONS, we learned uh, yeah, that there are also some uh, inconsistencies. I don't know which year you're referring to, um, because our data only dates back to 2015, and there are reasons, because the owner and the firm, the company maintaining the payment infrastructure, it's Vocalink, and they, there were some changes in, in who is owning the data in 2015 and also over time. This is another challenge uh, when working with payment data. At least in the UK, there have been many financial, there have been many reforms and mergers and acquisitions going on in the payment industry or in, in, in those own, in owning the data. So we cannot go back further than to 2015, but I looked, when we looked at the input and the analytical input output tables, I don't know whether they are used for, for um, whether this is what you're referring to, but I've, I've noted that the data is not always. I, I'm referring to the actual survey of purchases mm -hmm. by firms from other firms, which is real data. Um, mm -hmm. but it was, um, dropped for a number of years, and I forget, somebody from the ONS would no doubt be able to tell me when it was reinstated. <laughs> it was, the last one was produced in about 2005, and it was reinstated probably about the time your data starts, about yeah. 2015. Oh. So I suspect there isn't actually an overlap as it happened, which would have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. I think what I've taken from it is that although we're doing some really interesting stuff that I hope is, is going towards the cutting edge where we to the CERN, there are significant challenges in trying to produce um, these data to the quality necessary to publish um, as part of a national statistics organization. But I'm, I'm not disheartened. I think that we can and we will get to where we need to get with these data sets and I think it just shows promise and the, the progress that has been enabled by ESCO um, to enable this kind of cross-contamination across academic and um, national statistics organisations. Um, and I just want to thank all of the, the participants and presenters today for indulging me in um, hearing some interesting talks um, and asking some questions, let's say. Um, thanks everyone. Um, and I think it's drinks now, right? To the ex